Good morning. Welcome to Brandon Presbyterian Church. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as we gather to worship our redeeming God. If you're a visitor here, we're so happy you've chosen to worship with us. If you'll fill out a visitor's card and place it in the offering plate uh, or hand it to an usher, we'd love, love to have a record of your attendance and send you some information about the church. If you have been visiting for a while and are thinking about joining the church, please see uh, Pastor Mills for uh, details on that process. But yeah, we thank you to all the, the visitors we've had. We've been blessed with so many announcements. I, I'm going to keep it uh, brief today, but uh, as you can tell, we are partaking of the Lord's Supper at the end of the worship today, so continue to prepare your hearts for that this morning. There is a uh, new toy drive for the nursery. Some of those toys have been uh, pretty beaten up, and that's probably my daughter has a lot to do with that, but if you would like to purchase some new toys for the nursery, there's a website, there's an Amazon list where you can pick the ones you want to buy. Uh, if you have any questions on that, please see Emily Lee or Cecile Witten. Or if you don't want to go on the website to, to purchase anything, if you want to designate a gift and the offering for nursery toys, you can do that as well. Please look through the bulletin. We have a lot going on, um, a lot of different events coming up. And I would remind you to... Uh, Go through the prayer list this week that we have a lot of uh, members of our church and family members who are dealing with some difficult and challenging times. So, um, and, and I confess I, I don't do it enough either. So please pray through the list uh, that's there in your bulletin. And uh, with no more announcements, let's prepare our hearts for worship. stand for our call to worship. I'll read the light print and we'll read the bold together. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Then we will bless you as long as we live. In your name we lift up our voices. O oh Lord, in the morning you hear our voice. In the midst of this congregation hear our prayers. We come before you with our humble worship. We ask that you would condescend to our weakness and sustain us with your presence. Give attention to the sounds of our cry, our King and our God. For to you do we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn of praise is hymn number 310, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
seated. If you will turn again in your bulletin, our confession of faith today is the Apostles' Creed, a summary of our beliefs here. So we will uh, recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Even as we take time to confess our faith, what we believe about God, and how we trust in Him, we also recognize our need to confess our sin. And so we'll recite this confession of sin from Augustine together. Cleanse me from my secret faults, O Lord, and forgive those offenses to your servant, which he has caused in others. I contend not in judgment with you who are true. I fear to deceive myself, lest my sin should make me think that I am not sinful. Therefore, I contend not in judgment with you, for if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall abide it? Let's take some time also to quietly confess our particular sins to the Lord. Heavenly Father, each time we come before you, we are humbled. We come with reverence and awe because you are holy. And we come in humility because we are sinful. We recognize our unworthiness. So we want to confess that to you and recognize once again what you have done for us in sending your Son to take our place on the cross, to take your wrath against sin in our place. And so we thank you that we can hear this assurance of pardon for those who truly repent and who place their faith in Christ alone. Hear this, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our song that is inserted in your bulletin, Speak, O Lord.
You may be seated. That insert is proof positive that there are great, there is great Christian music being written in a contemporary time in the 21st century, not just the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Thank you for picking that out, having us, and playing for us too. I, I was struck by the words, and this is hard to read. <laughs> That's our problem, and we need to. <clears throat> that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That, that children's hymn that we know, the light is the light of Christ that reflects off of us, that we reflect, and this, this hymn just spells it out. I know we tell you every Sunday to take this, use it for your prayer list. Uh, it is full and replete with needs that are there, is also full of praise. Uh, just, just going down through the list, I'm looking at the Carmen's Please Pray for Jimmy and Lois and for strength and endurance and wisdom for Kathy and Joe. So that's something specific that we can pray for them. Uh, Brady Stewart, thank you for all your prayers. We've been praying for Brady for a, a while. Hayes Monser, please pray for his recovery. Our friend Charlie Moak. Down in the loved ones battling cancer, uh, we have seen the Lee's messages this week were sent out from the church office and certainly want to continue to pray for Ames and for his mom and daddy. And progress. There has been progress. Uh, praying for the bottom son. Thank you for continued prayers. We're praising God for his mercies. I'll begin with prayer. So let's go to the Lord now and ask for his wisdom and guidance and healing and love. Lord, we have all those things in Jesus Christ. And we come to you this morning praising you and thanking you for answered prayer. For this flock, we are bountifully blessed. We are encouraged and strengthened by each other, uh, by our pastor by our, our music that we sing, uh, but, but most of all by you as our Lord and Savior. We come to celebrate uh, your death this morning. We're celebrating the breaking of bread, the, the body <coughs> that was shed, uh, and the blood that was shed. And we will sing about there is a fountain filled with blood, not just a sprinkle, but a fountain that we need of your blood cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, uh, be with us this morning as we worship you, as we pray to you, uh, and we will give you the praise and the honor and the glory, and we will pray a prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings, let's be reminded from our bulletin from 2 Corinthians, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that thought he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that, th that you through his poverty might become rich. Let's give our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
Father, we thank you and praise you for how you have guided and blessed and sustained this church. We thank you for your many blessings to each of us here, how you blessed us beyond measure. Father, we confess we so often don't give generously with our uh, possessions and our time and our love. Father, I pray for your spirit to put in us a new heart that uh, we would better realize and appreciate the gifts you have given us and especially the gift of your son. We ask that you receive these tithes and offerings for the good of the church, for the spread of your gospel, and for all your glory. In your name I pray. Amen. Please be seated and let's dismiss our children for Children's Church. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 10. Pick up where we left off two weeks ago in verse 10, and we'll finish the chapter this morning. As we've been making our way through Daniel, we've seen it really breaking evenly into two different sections. You have the first six chapters where it's dealing with just a historical narrative of Daniel's life as well as his companions as they learn to stand firm in the face of, and then in the midst of, tribulation and trials. Uh, they're, they're learning to persevere. And it's sort of uh, how that takes place in their lives. And then the latter half got really confusing. But other than that, it was also a period of visions where Daniel and his companions are now given the reason why they should persevere, why it's important for them to do so. And we looked specifically at chapter 10, the first half of verses uh, just verses 1 through 9, um, and there's this visitation, this divine visitation for Daniel that he receives in a vision, and I argue that it was a Christophany. Um, I think in the parallel passages, uh, you looked at e- we look at Ezekiel, uh, especially Revelation chapter 1, you find the same language there. Revelation 1 is definitely speaking of Jesus visiting John in a vision and so you have a similar language here in Daniel and I would argue that it, uh, the parallels reveal what we're to think of who this figure was and we'll it, we'll see some of the challenges to that and why people have a have questioned that in our passage this morning but I think with Daniel's elaborate response this was something unique it was something that Daniel hadn't experienced before He had seen divine beings before in visions. He had been visited by Michael. He had been visited by by Gabriel. And his reaction was nothing like this. Um, And this was devastating to him. He was genuinely trembling and shaking in fear. And um, I think there's an intensity here that we will continue to see. We we talked about this two weeks ago as well, just the intensity of this glory, this, uh, of, of the intensity of faith and the intensity of worship, reflecting on the importance that when we gather together for worship, we're not simply to walk in flippantly. And this can be true of your own private and family worship as well. But certainly as we gather together corporately as the body of Christ, it's so easy to just be distracted by worldly cares, to have um, our mind wandering the entire service, especially during the sermon, right? And, and this is a time for us to recognize all the more that this is the, the word of the living God, that he is speaking to us. And we want to be, we want our hearts softened by his words. We want our, um, our minds enlightened. We want our affections stirred. We want to walk away humbled by this encounter, having glorified God as he alone is worthy to receive. 
And so we enter his presence with reverence and awe as we learn what he, uh, who he is and what he demands of us. So let's ask for his help before we read this passage together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the example that we have in Daniel's life. Uh, in these, even in this latter half, we see a man who is faithful to come to you in prayer to not just find a way to be comfortable, but to, to enter into a season of fasting and mourning, or experiencing physical and emotional pains as he seeks guidance and wisdom from you and comfort. And I pray that it would relate to us, Lord, that we would be encouraged by this example. And that ultimately we would see Christ in this passage because he is the one who we need most to cling to in times of trial and tribulation, in times of uncertainty, where we want to have our, our sights set on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so may we commune with you this morning as we sit under the preaching of your word and later in the service as we enjoy the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All of this be a means of your grace to strengthen us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Read with me Daniel chapter 10, beginning in verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up, trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh, my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Amen. This is God's holy word. Well, I have the privilege every three days after Easter of spending times with my closest friends at Twin Lakes Fellowship. And most of them carry in, um, as they travel, they carry all of their, their clothes in this, you know, carry-on suitcase. So it's not a, a giant suitcase. We're there for three days, but it's enough to kind of have everything in it and then to pack some books on your way back. But there was one friend who, who always brings all he needs in a simple backpack. Uh, I, I don't know how he does. Well, I do. But, he, but, you know, I think it's part of his military background just gives him this efficiency in packing and this desire to pack light. And so he comes with nothing but a, a backpack, although this 
this week, I noticed he brought in a rolling backpack. So he's starting to upgrade a little bit. I think the rest of us are rubbing off on him. But imagine if you had to pack all of your worldly cares and carry them along with you wherever you went. I don't think we'd get away with, doing it in a, with carrying it in a backpack. Right? We'd probably be finding some way to put those moving pods, stack them up on a cart that we would you know, push along. We'd find some way of motorizing it so that we could just keep packing it on and just carry it everywhere we go with us. Thomas Manton, who was the clerk of the uh, Westminster Assembly, uh, English Puritan from the 17th century, said this, If life be short, then moderate your worldly cares and projects. Do not cumber yourselves with too much provision for a short voyage. Now, the only way that any of us are going to take that kind of advice is if we recognize that the things that we, that we are carrying, the baggage that weighs us down, if we would let go of that, there would be something of greater value, something of infinite worth to replace it. And so we have to change the question that we're asking on what we need for this journey to what prepares us for eternity. That's a far more important question to be asking ourselves as we go about our lives. And this is at a time in the life of Israel when the exile has just ended. So the question has changed. For the past 70 years, they've been asking what Psalm 137 verse 4 says. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we be faithful when we're here, when we're so far away from the temple, when, we've, when we don't have the resources that we've grown up with? They've been asking that for 70 years, and yet now that they're back in Israel, or at least they have the opportunity to go back, which many of them took that opportunity to go, are now back in Israel, and according to Haggai, they're more concerned with building their paneled houses than rebuilding the temple of God. They're back. The thing that they've been longing to do. And now they're caught up in their worldly cares. They're caught up taking care of themselves and they're unconcerned with the situation of the temple. And so the prophets are now asking, how can we, and this is really the question in Haggai, how can we restore God's presence among his people? How can we stir them up to desire the presence of God once again, to, to call upon him whose spirit was there with them, but they were not acknowledging him? And how often do we busy ourselves with worldly cares when the living God has called us to commune with him. And you know, we can be thinking about that throughout the week, privately, in our homes, but especially when we gather for corporate worship. I want us to think about the worldly cares that oftentimes distract us and busy our minds rather than focusing on communing with the living God. Whenever we encounter God in worship, in true worship, he engages our hearts and he equips us for service. And that's what we'll see in this passage. The first thing I want us to consider is that God hears you. This is a, what, he, what he acknowledges to Daniel. I recall the reaction that Daniel and his companions had in the previous passage. In verses 7 through 9, you had the, the men who were with Daniel who couldn't see the vision, but they... They obviously heard and maybe felt something, and it caused them to tremble so fearfully that they, that they fled to hide. They fled away from the scene. And so Daniel alone was on the scene. He alone experienced the fullness of that vision. And what did it do? It trained him of strength, according to verse 8. And upon hearing the sound of the words of the, of the Christophany, of, of the figure who came to him, who I said was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, he falls on his face before him in worship. And while he's face on the ground, he, fle he feels a hand touching him. 
and he begins to tremble. Some people question whether this is the same figure. I think it's much easier to translate the whole passage as referring to the, the same figure. It makes the most sense to me than trying to put different, different, different angelic beings in, in, in place. Um, but this hand that touches him causes him to tremble while he's, while he's still face on the ground, right? He's, he's, he's there maybe getting up on his knees and hands and he's trembling. And Christ reminds him that he is a man greatly loved. He's already been told that previously. He reminds him again. And he, saw, he, he emphasizes this value that Daniel has before God. He's desirable. He's precious to God. And so he sends his son to give him understanding. And we read that Daniel stands up in response, but he's still trembling. He stands up, but he's shaking. And we know he's trembling out of fear because the next verse says, do not be afraid, do not fear. Now to be sure, there's a sense of awe in what Daniel is witnessing and, and feeling and hearing in the voice. But there's also a great sense of unworthiness. He's in awe of this visitor, but he's also recognizing and acknowledging how unworthy he is to receive this great, glorious vision. This is the secret of his spiritual sensitivity, and that, that he feels deeply the grace of God as the hand of Christ is placed upon him and the voice of Christ exhorts him. There's a, there's a sense of the magnitude of the moment. He doesn't flee and hide like the others. He stands and trembles. So he has courage as well as humility in this moment. And we've seen that throughout the book, haven't we? In, his, in the historical narratives as well as in the visions, we continue to see a faithful servant of God. In fact, in verse 12, it says that that's why this messenger has come, to give him understanding and because of his humility. Now we get to verse 13 and we get some challenges. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Later on in verse 20, you hear about this prince of Greece. What's taking place here? Some would say this is just, these are, these are kings, these are rulers of these nations. But this is a spiritual being. So the idea that, or the likelihood of him battling the, the kings of these nations doesn't make sense. What this is, I think, and most commentators believe, is, is it's appealing back of, of kind of that physical world so we can see the spiritual realm beneath it. We can see this warfare that's taking place at all times and that there are fallen angels who are influencing the nations who are opposed to God and his people. And so they're fighting this spiritual battle. It's referring to the spiritual beings who are influencing the world leaders. Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul tells us this, right? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. How do we do that? In prayer. Right? We don't physically fight. We are spiritually prepared. As we'll, when, when we get through Ephesians, and at the end we'll see that we put on the, the armor of God. It's a spiritual armor prepared for spiritual battle. So Daniel's prayer, this was what was taking place behind his praying. This was the spiritual warfare that was taking place. It's interesting that the length of time that the prince of Persia fought with Christ was the same length of Daniel's praying 
with fasting and mourning back in verse 2. It's three weeks. Here it mentions 21 days. So God sent his son on the first day of Daniel's prayer, but this is the spiritual conflict that delayed him. Clearly Satan was attempting to thwart Christ's mission altogether at this moment. And again, if this is a Christophany, then receiving Michael's help is no different than God sending angels to do his bidding in the first place. That the, the fact that God has a host of angels who fight his battles is not, a, is not a reflection of his weakness. It's a reflection of his authority and power. The fact that Christ relies upon Michael to, do, to, to fight alongside him doesn't mean that Christ was incapable of handling it himself. He has his purposes. And this delay has a purpose as well. God is doing something for Daniel, through Daniel by not showing up immediately. Could Daniel, or could God have rescued him immediately? Could God have come to his aid on that first day? Of course he could have. But this spiritual warfare is meant to reflect something of God's commitment to his people and of the importance of prayer, really the power of prayer. You might say the, the power of God that is unleashed through prayer. Daniel prayed and spiritual warfare followed. I don't think we think about that very often. This passage is a glimpse into that unseen reality that's always taking place. You can reflect on 2 Kings 6, verses 15 through 17 for a remarkable example of that as well, where God displays that spiritual army that was protecting and surrounding his prophet. And so it's a reality that we need to frequently remind ourselves and others about. I like how Abraham Kuyper puts it. He says, if, on, if once the curtain were pulled back and the spiritual world behind it came to view, it would expose our spiritual vision, a struggle, it would expose to our spiritual vision, a struggle so intense, so convulsive, sweeping everything within its range that the fiercest battle ever fought on earth would seem by comparison a mere game. Not here, but up there. That is where the real conflict is waged. Our earthly struggle drones in its backlash. So Christ has now arrived after three weeks of this spiritual war, and he, remind, he tells Daniel at the end of this passage that he'll be returning to finish that battle, and he'll be battling someone else later on as well. But he's here now to show something to Daniel, to give Daniel understanding of things that will happen to Israel in the latter days phrase of eschatological purpose and meaning. But God graciously gave Daniel an experience to then share with those who were growing up within a covenant community and within a context where people were deflated by decades of spiritual apathy. And they were in exile. And that might have been an understandable. But it had an effect on them to where they were no longer spiritually inclined to honor God. And so when they got back to the promised land, it's as if they just continued to focus on themselves, to do their own thing, to do what their worldly cares. And so through this prophecy now, they received hope of a future victory. And we'll talk more about that as we get to chapter 11 and 12. Think about this. Have the cares of this world begun to choke out your faith? Maybe you can relate to their spiritual apathy. If so, then Daniel's experience should remind you what it's like for your heart to be engaged in true worship. To be moved to the point of trembling. To be reminded that God not only hears your prayers, but he comes to your defense in a war that you have no clue how severe it is. And Daniel had been praying and with fasting and mourning for three weeks without any knowledge of this battle that had been waged. 
on behalf of his people. It will only be in glory that we'll be able to comprehend the torments that God spared us from enduring in this life. And forever we'll be able to give him praise and glory that he's worthy to receive. But because God hears your prayers, you should anticipate the impact of his response. And that's what you see in verses 15 through 17, that God burdens you. God hears you, but God burdens you. Tell Ralph Davis tells a story uh, uh, that, that he heard or read about from John MacArthur. A man once waited to speak with John MacArthur after a conference. And he told him how he oftentimes saw the Lord, that he had visions of Jesus. And that Jesus talked to him often. For instance, as an example, he said, even while I'm shaving, Jesus will, will talk to me, will show up. And John MacArthur said, I just have one question. Do you stop shaving? There's almost a, a way to be flippant about encountering Christ that we lose sight of, the, of reality. There's, there's no possible way that he could just be having these casual encounters throughout his life. If so, he would be so spiritually blind that he wasn't seeing what he was beholding and interacting with because it would have devastated him to see that kind of glory in this fallen world. And so notice the deep impact this encounter has Upon Daniel, the sound of the words that Daniel heard caused him to fall face down before him in verse 9. The effect of the speech he hears in verses 11 through 14 are now described by him in verses 15 through 17. He goes mute. He can't speak. He, he's still standing, trembling, but he looks down and he's speechless. And then Christ touches his lips apparently giving him the ability to speak, and all he can manage to say is, I don't have any strength. I'm without breath. This vision has devastated me. <clears throat> Daniel is so overwhelmed that he doubts he even has the capacity to hear the rest of, or to see the rest of the vision. How can I do this when I, I don't have any strength? Eventually, we see in verse 19 that Christ, the same Christ begins to touch him and, and speak to him to strengthen Daniel. So literally, every time Christ speaks, Daniel is physically, emotionally, and spiritually moved by the experience. Daniel is burdened by the intensity of the vision, and he has no idea what to do next. Now, we ought to be grateful for one, just as an aside, grateful, because this is just one example of what the prophets endured on our behalf to give us the revealed will of God. It might be just what we need to hear to snap us out of a spiritual slumber, to witness and reflect upon what Daniel experienced. Hardened hearts might be softened by the recognition of the cost that our forefathers paid to not only give us the word, but to preserve it for us. But oftentimes, God gives us burdens that are meant to be shared. And there's a, a mystery about how this works, right? I can't diagram it for you in a Sunday school class. But there are some really incredible illustrations of it. And maybe my favorite one, although it is oftentimes overused, is from Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. The return of the king specifically, Frodo's been tasked with bearing this one ring back to Mount Doom and destroying it where Saur Sa Sauron had forged it. And the closer he came, the heavier the burden was. And it left Frodo without any strength to walk. And it says on the last day of his journey, he stands up and he's just so frail that he falls right back to the ground. And he begins to look up at the top of Mount Doom and, and he just crawls on his hands. And his friend, Sam, is there and he cries out, come, Mr. Frodo. 
I can't carry it for you, speaking of the ring, I can't carry that for you, but I can carry you and it as well. So you get up. Sam will give you a ride. Just tell him where, you, where to go, and he'll go. And I'm going to read the whole thing because you don't paraphrase Tolkien. But as Frodo clung upon his back, arms loosely about his neck, legs clasped firmly under his arms, Sam staggered to his feet, and then to his amazement, he felt the burden light. He had feared that he would have barely the strength to lift his master alone, and beyond that, he had expected to share in the dreadful dragging weight of the accursed ring. But it was not so. Whether because Frodo was so worn by his long pains, wound of knife and venomous sting and sorrow, fear and homeless wandering, or because some gift of final strength was given to him, Sam lifted Frodo with no more difficulty than if he were carrying a hobbit child, piggyback, in some romp on the lawns or hayfields of the Shire. He took a deep breath and started off. It's a beautiful picture of bearing another's burden. Tolkien was not allegorizing, as he's clear to argue. But he was envisioning in this scene, as he envisioned this scene unfolding, he was getting at a spiritual truth that is at the heart of this passage in Daniel. Because Daniel's experience is an example of learning to trust in the kindness and grace of someone else. He had become so drained by this encounter that he was utterly dependent upon Christ. His encounter with Christ had left its mark. You see something similar in Pilgrim's Progress. How can I not mention this? Speaking of a burden, Christian sets out on his travel with this gigantic burden on his back, and it slows him down, and it makes it difficult for him to climb. And some think that that burden should have been removed from him as he passed through the wicked gate, as he places his trust in Christ. But I think it's not necessarily a theological point that's being made here, but a, a point of our experience. Because even after our sin's been forgiven, what do we do? We carry that guilt and that shame with us. And it's like a great burden on our back. Maybe you're thinking... The idea of God burdening us further, it doesn't sound very appealing. Why would we want that? I'll just avoid church altogether. I get, I've, I've got enough shame and guilt to deal with. And Jesus tells us that his burden is light. What does that mean? That when he removes the massive burden of our guilt and shame, he replaces it with a burden of gratitude a growing desire to experience more of him and to offer ourselves to him fully, physically, emotionally, spiritually. A life of gratitude is full but fulfilling. It's overwhelming but satisfying in an ultimate sense. Samuel Rutherford said, his cross is the sweetest burden that I ever bore. It is such a burden as wings are to a bird or sails are to a ship to carry me forward to my harbor. And so the burden that comes from the Lord drives our faith. It's unlike worldly cares. It never hinders our walk. It only deepens our appreciation for what he has done. And so when this burden has its full effect, we are equipped to serve God and others well. In this last section, I'm just going to conclude with a brief statement that God strengthens you. And then we're going to receive that strength as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The same touch and the same voice that left Daniel trembling and drained of strength is now returning his strength. Look what it says. The one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. 
And he said, O um, oh man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened. The, the, it's the same language we just heard that left him drained, unable to speak, breathless, now restores him, stronger than before. And so this whole elaborate process is really an introduction to the vision that he receives, this final vision that it will get into in chapter 11 and 12. It was all by means of preparation for him to receive the vision, and I hope this sermon has adequately pre prepared us to be strengthened by our Savior as we receive his supper. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. that we do have the privilege of communing with you, even as we have done throughout this worship service, and yet there is something sacramental, something special, <clears throat> set apart by this table. Where we're not just remembering what Christ did for us, but we're tasting and seeing his goodness, <clears throat> reflecting upon his redemptive love for us. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to go through those same burdens, that we would be acknowledging that you hear us even now, that you rejoice over us, you commune with us through this meal. And Lord, the burden of our sin has been dealt with on the cross. And yet you give us a a new calling, a new vocation that also involves our whole being. And we can be brought down by our suffering, we can be brought down by our circumstances, and you lift us up, you strengthen us. I pray that we would be strengthened by this sacrament, that you would continue to do this work that you did in Daniel's life and each one of our lives. And as we reflect upon this fountain that is filled with blood, may we rejoice in your goodness and be moved by your compassion. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of preparation, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood, hymn number 253. We're just going to sing verses, the first three stanzas, and then we'll sing the last two after, uh, or stanzas four and five after the, the Lord's Supper. So please stand.
seated. In your meditation, I put the quote from Hippolytus, a early church father from the third century who was reflecting upon this passage we just sat under. He said, for whenever all the strength of our life and its glory pass from us, and then are we strengthened by Christ, who stretches forth his hand and raises the living from among the dead, and as it were, from Hades itself to the resurrection of life. It's a great way of putting it. Charles Spurgeon said, the best way to get your faith strengthened is to have communion with Christ. Westminster Divine speak of this inestimable value of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Because our comforts and strength are renewed for our pilgrimage and warfare. We are encouraged to come with knowledge, faith, repentance, love, as well as with a hungering and a thirsting after Christ and his benefits. And so that's the first requirement for participation, that you are a believer who is growing and repenting and walking with the Lord. And so we celebrate the Father's love for us through his Son, who is spiritually present at his table. We enjoy fellowship or communion with him in his body and blood. We feed upon him by faith in our hearts as we partake of a spiritual food and a spiritual drink. And though the Lord's Supper, or through the Lord's Supper, we receive his sustaining grace. Our souls are fed. We find refreshment as we commune with him. And it's, we, we come with an awareness of our sin. We've confessed our sin earlier. We come humbled by that. And yet we come bruised and battered by the world, carrying a load of guilt and shame. Worldly cares piling up. And yet Jesus extends his invitation to restore us to an honored place at his table. It's hard to envision that in a setting like this, right? But this is the Lord's table and it's as if we're dining with him enjoying a meal. We're renewed and we're strengthened. And by this sacrament, Christ and all his benefits are applied and sealed up unto us. But scripture also warns us of the great danger of participating in an unworthy manner. If you don't understand what these elements represent, maybe you haven't made a public profession of your faith, you haven't been baptized in as a sign and seal of your entrance into the covenant community, then we would encourage you to wait until you've done that. Likewise, if you're living in unrepentant sin, in defiance of Christ and his commands, we discourage you from coming to his holy table until you receive the gift of repentance. And this doesn't mean that you have to come perfect, but you're acknowledging that you're a repenting believer. You're acknowledging your sin before him, confessing it, seeking to turn away from that sin to the Lord. Because if not, then what is meant to be a blessing becomes judgment upon you. And this warning is not meant to discourage those of you who might be even more aware of your sin after sitting under this preaching. The preaching of his word. Maybe you're burdened by the weight of guilt Maybe there's a sense of, of trembling as you come before a holy God to commune with him. That does not make you unworthy to participate. But it does mean that you need to depend upon Christ to make you worthy. And so if you've placed your faith in him as your savior, then your coming to this table is one of his precious means for easing for refreshing, for strengthening your weak and wearied souls. And so come to this table with a proper humility, but come with confidence because you've been clothed in his righteousness and because he has invited you to receive his grace through this meal. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we come to receive your grace with humble acknowledgement of our misery that our sin has brought upon us. We recognize that we are unworthy to receive your great mercy. And yet we thank you for the redemption that we have found in Christ alone. Thank you for this visible reminder that we've been rescued from the wrath we deserved through the suffering of your only son. Not only did our Lord die for us, but he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and now sits at your right hand, interceding on our behalf right now. We've been fed by your word, and now in this sacrament we taste and see your goodness, and that you alone can satisfy our deepest longings. So we profess that there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved, but the name of Jesus Christ, by whom alone we receive liberty and life, have access to the throne of grace, are admitted to eat <clears throat> and drink at his own table, and are sealed up by his spirit to an assurance of happiness and everlasting life. And so we earnestly ask you, the Father of all mercies and the God of all consolation, to attend to us now with your gracious presence. We ask that you would sanctify these elements of bread and cup, cause us to be edified by the work of your spirit in and through this celebration as we receive the body and blood of Christ crucified for us. We trust that by this sacrament, Christ and all his benefits are applied and sealed up unto us as we feed upon him by faith. For your glory we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you, and be not dismayed, I am your God, 
I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Christ's body given for you. Eat it now. In the same manner, he took the cup, and after giving thanks as has, been done, as has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Christ's blood shed for you. I invite you to stand as we sing the last two stanzas of our hymn.
now the Lord's benediction. May you be blessed whose strength is in the Lord, you who have set your hearts in pilgrimage, who go from strength to strength till you appear before God in the heavenly Zion. Amen. Thank you.